everybody, this is Nine with V Side. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be interviewing Danielle Eva Schwab. She's a New York based musician who does anything you can think of from uh, classical music to jazz to uh, movie soundtracks. And this upcoming album is like uh, an ancient, um, maybe Tolkien sort of feeling meeting sci fi. Um, you will really, really like her music. I promise you, we're going to play some of it on the show and also talk with her quite a bit about the process. Don't forget, we're also trying to get to the UK. Please help our fundraiser. We're going to go to WOMAD, uh, Rebellion, and Fringe Festivals, as well as interviewing dozens of artists. Some you may know, and some are going to be new to you all over the UK, from Belfast to London to Edinburgh and Manchester. Um, please help us out. Go to the links below. Thanks, everyone. Peace out. All right, so Danielle, thank you very much for joining us on the B-Side. We're glad to have you here. Um, and let's talk about your new project. It's called Delania. Yes. And your your single is outstanding. We, we were really excited to get to talk to you because we thought it was, um, at the same time, um, really futuristic sounding, but also like, um, ancient sounding at the same time um very oh, Michael, was that? thank you it, it was it was very it reminded us sort of like um if if uh, there's an old old sci-fi movie that sean connery was in called outlander and it sort of reminded us of like if outlander and it, uh, and a james bond theme song had met uh pan's labyrinth or something too it was it oh was those are like you just that's that's the nicest Thing that you could have said about the song thank you I really <laughs> oh, you're welcome um so, so tell us, <laughs> how, how did you what in your background has led you to this creation and then sound um i think probably a a combination of things i mean i guess i've i've grown up being involved i've been involved with music since really as far back as i can remember and it's always been a couple of different different like multiple genres and different areas of music I mean growing up I, I, I studied classical music from a long age from a young age and I also you know trained, like, studied as a guitar player and so I grew up playing in bands and doing the rock thing um, and then I went into I went to school for classical composition and I've, I've kind of stayed active in in both worlds both as a concert and film composer and then also as a songwriter and this project to me even though it really it clearly fits under the like so, I don't know what you want to call it. Like I'm actually going to steal what you said. I think I think ancient futuristic sci-fi James Bond music. Like I think yeah. that's what I'm going to call it from now on. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely it fits into the it fits into my my the, the, under the umbrella of my work as a songwriter. But to me, that project it so clearly has like a cinematic vibe to it and a scope that comes from my concert music. I don't know if that answers your question, but to me, it's it's like a sort of an alternative songwriter, rock, whatever you want to call it, record that's very, very much influenced by my work as a concert composer. So tell, tell me about your early, early life in music then. Did you start out playing classical music and then sort of 
did the the teenage rebellion into rock and then and then came back to classical again or was there a different path uh no it was pretty much that when i was really little uh my dad actually tried to teach me classical guitar when i was around seven and it stuck for maybe maybe a year and a half and then i wound up singing in choirs and i think i tried cello for a minute and a few things and then i kind of gave up on music for a little bit for a little while and then i picked up I don't know, I can't remember what spurred it. I think it was listening to, I think I really just, I really discovered rock when I was a teenager and uh, picked up the electric guitar when I was about 14 and was just like, this is, this is it. And then um, through that, I think like when I, when I got a little bit older, when I, I was, I was starting to think about going to music school and I decided that I, you know, I could go and study guitar, but my ambitions were, were a little grander than that. And so I thought I would go, I always, I kind of wanted to be in charge of the big picture. And so I decided I should study composition instead because that would, you know, that would give me kind of more of a, a bird's eye view of music and I'd have a lot more control over what I was doing. Where did, where did you study? Um, I did my undergrad at NYU, uh, and then I did a semester in the graduate program at Manhattan School of Music, but I, I'm a grad school dropout. I didn't finish. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I think you're doing all right. Oh, yeah, it was, a, it was a good thing. Um, no, school, school is great, but I, I think for me at the, at the time, it was I, I'd been in New York for a while, and I was already working, and it just seemed like I, I don't really know why I'm I, should, I prefer learning on the job than I do learning in a classroom, so I, I just decided to do that. Yeah, it's 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 not always the best thing. I teach film and television production oh. at a high school, cool. um, and and one of the things that I tell them is that you don't need to go to school, right? It's it's not everybody can afford the what is it seventy eight thousand dollars a year at Tisch or yeah. USC or whatever, but it's, it's not always necessary, right? It's, it's sometimes um, working your way from the bottom up or being on the ground and learning hands-on is much better than what you could get sitting in the classroom anyway. So it's, yeah, there's really no right way to do any of this. I mean, I know, I know people who've been hugely successful who have no training and I know people who've been hugely successful but have like 10 degrees. So it's, I think at the end of the day, it's just like, do you, do you work hard and is what you're doing good. It just comes down to what you're making always. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us what brought you to this project then. What's, what was the, what was the inspiration for um, the single and also for the upcoming album? Yeah. Well, there, there's a lot of overlap between them. Um, they, they were, when I, it's funny, when I started off, so the, the single and the record have uh, a lot of overlapping themes. There are a lot to do with uh, with technology and the strange connected yet disconnected lives that we, we lead today. You know, we're, we're talking to each other on a screen. I've got like someone sending me messages on a phone right now. You know, before that I was online, like checking my email and everything. And um, 
I, I really have spent a lot of time over the past few years just thinking about how how these devices really affect people's lives um, and more specifically mine. I mean, when I like learning to become a good songwriter, a composer, a arranger, anything like that, just a creative person in general, really takes quite a lot of time. And so when I was working on this record, um, or not even this record, but just, you know, you spend a lot of time in a room by yourself writing and practicing and like trying to get better at production and like trying to figure out why your arrangements don't sound the way you want them to. And that process can be, it can be quite isolating. And I just found it very jarring. Um, like you're sitting in a room working on all this stuff while you're simultaneously connected to everyone that you've ever known via these these platforms. That was, that's strange. And also, just, I don't think I'm, an, I'm alone in being a little concerned about where the, the world is heading in regards to how these, almost the dehumanization of people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it was, I'm, I'm getting off on a little bit of a tangent, but um, I suppose there, so there was a time, it's autobiographical, but my hope is that it also relates to these conversations as a whole, as people can relate to them in general. Um, it's it's definitely a conversation that is is yeah. prevalent right now and, and i'm a father of six and i can have all my children in the house at the same time and we can all be completely disconnected because everyone can be plugged in on a device doing something different or that some something that kind of freaks me out sometimes is that their main source of connectivity with their friends is playing a game online with them so that they're they're with them and completely not with them yeah. at all or even just the act of texting someone is takes so much longer a conversation in text takes so much longer than if you actually picked up the phone <laughs> and yeah. someone on the phone and, and that takes 30 seconds what would take five ten minutes in texting right Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've started calling people again recently. I mean, I text too, because sometimes sometimes if something doesn't require like a fast response, you might as well just... It's fun. It's like an easy way to keep in touch with people. But yeah, you're right. You're not you're not really keeping in touch with them. You're sort of just interacting with each other's... Well, if you're on social media, it's like each other's avatars. And if you're on text, it's just like, you might as well just be sending letters back and forth. It's really... Very yeah. My, my oldest son when he moved out of the house, got his first apartment, I said, okay, the, the one thing that I really want from you is to each week send your mom a letter, a handwritten letter. That's sit lovely. Down, sit down at a desk, take time to, you know, think what you want to tell her and, and send a letter once a week. And I, I understand that there's a video in the works for the yes. single. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. tell, tell us kind of, uh, we don't have it yet. We're, we hope to get it as soon as it's available, but tell us a little bit what it's like. I'm, I'm envisioning something. Um, it's, it's quite a few things. It's, so it's directed by this, this wonderful director, uh, Charlie, Charlie Mysack. Um, and he and I worked on the project for a little while. Um, and we wanted to cast a dancer. And so we ended up working with this, uh, this, really really talented um she's she's like starting to to really make waves in her world this this girl named uh leal zielinska um and so she's she's sort of the the star of the thing if i'm in it as well i don't want to give away too much it's um, sure. it's sort of a little it's beautifully shot it's it's a little sci-fi and a little dystopian but also like really grounded in the current time as well um, and we shot it. Uh, we shot it on an abandoned military base in Jersey, and then partly in New York as well. And um, I also worked with another another friend of mine who does projection mapping, and it's it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool piece. We're, we're very proud of it. Well, our producer Campbell was saying that the sound of the song reminded him of the scene in the original Blade Runner movie when Harrison Ford. Naming things that I like, sorry. <laughs> so it reminded him of the scene when Harrison Ford is sitting at his piano and he's having a drink and having memories that maybe aren't his um, going through his head and he's sitting there just kind of tinkering around on the, on the keyboard and um, 
how how it has um, a, a really introspective sound to it, but yet something that has this the the orchestration of it is is all encompassing at the same time. So it's like lonely and inclusive to everyone's sort of loneliness at the same time. And all this change starts looking the same. Another restless day. Wish I could slow down, get out of That's my hope. I my goal for this project and really just my I guess my songwriting in general, I like to I like to take um like sort of small I'm not trying to think how to explain this, like introspective, like per very personal, introspective, small, quiet, internal experiences, and like mm -hmm. really blow them up on a on a big on a large scale. So I'm glad that that it seems as though that's that's come across. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly how it felt. Um, talk to me a little bit about your your movie scoring. Um, what what you've done, and maybe what's you have something upcoming. Um, yeah, I'm working on, actually working on a, a, a film, a little, it's, I don't know what to call it because it's like a series of short films um, with this director, uh, Francisco Oravagnano. So yeah, he's a, he's a really, really talented director um, and who's done a few features and then this project is sort of more on the experimental side. It's these like these short, these interviews, like actually kind of ties into what I was just talking about with my songwriting. It's like very, very personal, intimate interviews with people who are, he called it, they're, he said they're, they're being emotionally available on camera, mm -hmm. which I thought was a lovely way of putting it. Um, and so I've been doing the music for some of those. Um, that's, that's the thing I have going on at the moment. There are a couple of other projects that I'm up for that might happen, which I'm not, I'm not going to say for the time being, because as soon as you say it, then I... Yeah. It doesn't happen till it happens. Exactly. So, and those, if those happen, those will be very exciting. Um, and then, I mean, most of the past year has really been finishing up this record and some of my concert work because I'm, I'm also involved in the, the classical world too. So I have an album of chamber music coming up. Um, I have a big project that I'm doing with this other, um, this classical, this other classical trio that uh, is about this astrophysicist named Vera, named Vera Rubin. I don't know if you know who she was, but she was she was kind of a. You're nodding. I don't need to explain. No, a, a pioneer. Yeah, she was amazing. She yeah, was amazing. But we've won a couple of grants for that project, and so we're finishing that up. Um, I've had some arranging projects for film as well recently, uh, but really most of my efforts have been focused. My energies have been focused on this this record. Well, the two the two records actually. When this when this album comes out, um, are you expecting to do um, any kind of live performances, touring, yes. that sort of stuff? Tell us about that. Yeah, that's all. That's all in the works at the moment. Um, I'll definitely be going on uh, a small tour in the fall. There's a chance I might do some some uh, one-off dates over the summer as well, probably uh, towards the end of July and August. I mean, this record to me, when I set out to make it, I really it's designed to be played live like it works so well with a band and I it was really very important to me that it was a it was a project that would really translate well to that setting like so so often when you hear like a lot of times when you hear these sort of hybrid like rock songwriter electronic parts it's like some dude at the back with a, with a laptop and playing tracks and everything and that that's really boring and I've certainly made music like that in the past, but this, this to me is really going to live, live on the stage. It's, it's big. Um, you know, I can put, I can put a big rock band on it. I can put some, some strings on it if I need to. Um, and it'll be, it'll be quite a show. So you said that was important to you. Why was it important for it to be live for you, or good live? It works live. I mean, that's the that's the point of the whole exercise, really, for me, just getting up and. Um, really being able to communicate with people on a stage and just, there's there's nothing like going to see a great show I mean the, the the way I got into music when I was a teenager was going to gigs as it is for all of us but um there's just nothing like standing out in 
in the room as in, in, in the room on if you're well either if you're in the audience on the on the floor or if you're on the stage and just hearing like the sound of a really loud like a really loud amp or like a really great drum sound or it's just great that's that's the point of the whole the whole exercise. Making records is fun and everything, but um, and I love doing that too. It's just it's it's very different. But I think that's that's really where music comes to life for me. Um, and and tell us a little bit about you. You grew up on in in London, mm -hmm. yes. And do you still have connections there? Do you have plans to tour there as well? Or yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I haven't been back to the UK. I think since twenty seventeen, which is kind of insane because I used to go back. Actually, I worked on part of this project over there. Mm -hmm. um, I was working with uh, a guy that I know who works at Abbey Road. So we were we were there for a little bit of time before we tracked the whole thing in New York, but I, I worked on some of the songs over there. Mm -hmm. when we were in, I guess pre-production for lack of a better way of describing it. Um, yeah, I still know a lot of people in London. I still feel I still feel really connected to to Britain. I mean, I guess the place that you grow up, you never you can leave it, but you don't ever really leave it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'm gonna. I'm planning to spend a decent amount of time over there for this project, and also probably Canada as well, because I have my dad is Canadian, so I have ties to too. Nice. We're gonna be in uh, in Blackpool uh, for the Rebellion Fest uh, cool. in August. Yeah, we're pretty excited about that. So we're we're hoping to do some other things around uh, England and Scotland while we're there as well. So good for for music that's a little like left of center the uk's just got such an amazing history of churning it, out. it has a really interesting scene right now too i there's um there's some bands in in london that are almost like um uh appalachian type of uh they're, they're doing like banjo and and that sort of off-key appalachian harmony that's that's uh uh soggy bottom boys kind of music that's cool. um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we're we're pretty excited to be tooling around there. Um, so so talk to us a little bit too about the engineering process and who worked on it. Sure. Yeah. So um, it went through quite a few different phases. Um, everything. So I, I I wrote the whole thing. I don't really. I'm not not to knock people who who do this at all, but uh, it's it wasn't really it wasn't a project born out of like tons of co-writing sessions or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So. I wrote and demoed the whole thing pretty extensively uh, in my home studio here, where we are. Actually, only part of it's here at the moment. A lot of it, the rest of it's in, in storage because I'm kind of back and forth from LA at the moment. Um, so yeah, a lot of it was in, initially worked on here. Uh, and then I worked on it with another friend uh, in London named Pierce McIntyre, who was in Abbey Road for a bit, and now he's at Tile Yard. And he, he did some he did some programming on it. I did some more programming. Um, that process was very, very collaborative. And then I brought it back. You know, it, originally it had more of kind of an electronic vibe to it. And a lot of that stuff has still, it's wound up in the final, uh, it, it, it wound up in the final mixes. But um, partway through that process, it really started feeling like uh, it needed to, it needed to have a lot more live elements on it. I, w I wasn't sure when I started off working on the thing, whether it was going to be an electronic project or a band project or somewhere in between the two, which is where it ended up. And so I brought it back to New York and um, I took it to uh, David Bottrell, who, who's an, just, I mean, in my opinion, like one, really one of the best producers of all time and also just like a, a wonderful, wonderful human who, um, so I, I, so he, he came down to New York and uh, we, did a bunch of band sessions with some guys that I work with out here. Some of them are now in LA. So there are, there are a few people involved and some of them were, uh, so Adam Magatti, I played guitar and then Adam also played guitar. Uh, Nick Semrad, who's a wonderful keyboard player. Um, I had a lot of string player friends who played on it. Uh, Jenny Choi was one, Andy Lin, who's an amazing violist. Uh, who else was there? Uh, a couple of drummers, Jim Orso and Aaron Steele, uh, and a couple of like, bass players, uh, Ruben Kainer and Jordan Brooks. I can't remember. I played a lot of it too, though. There's still quite a lot of my my synth, uh, my synth work, a lot of my programming, a lot of guitar playing, and obviously I did all the vocals too. But then vocals we ended up doing uh, mostly in Toronto with with David. He has a 
just a really nice recording setup where he just a studio setup where he is. So I was up there for a while, uh, and then we mixed a lot of it up there. So yes, David David engineered the project and also mixed it, uh, and then we had Emily Lazar master it, which was just such a such a treat because she's well both of them. I mean, talk about like having great people. Working on it. So. The collaboration between an engineer having somebody to bounce something off of. Why is that important for you? Because it's it's totally doable technology wise for you to just sit in your home studio there and do everything by yourself. That's a great question, and I'm really glad you asked that. Um, it's a lot of reasons. I mean, to me, like, I didn't get into making music because I wanted. Well, it's a few things. It's like a, I didn't get into music because I wanted to sit in a room by myself. I got into it because. It's like this amazing thing that you can do with people where you collaborate and you make something that's bigger and better and more interesting than you would, than any one person would be able to do on their own. Um, so that, which actually segues nicely into the, the next reason, which is that I, I just think, I think when you work with people, they, yeah. When you work with people who are slightly different from you and just have other ideas to bring to the table, that's where the stuff that's really interesting happens to me. Because someone will suggest something that like maybe you hadn't thought of, or you'll suggest something that they hadn't thought of, and then you kind of toss ideas around. And then ultimately it'll open up doors. And um, there's I'm happiest when I'm like working with people that that I can learn like we can we can learn stuff from each other and and, and push each other and, and it's, like, it's a good way to, I don't like to feel like I'm stagnant. And I think the best way to, the best way to ensure that you're always moving forward is to have other really talented people around and like let them have their input on your project and, and see where, see where things go. So. And I, I, don't, I don't know if it's like this for you, but for me, when I'm in a studio, I get two things that, that are really bonuses for me. One is that I feel like I have to, keep my game really high um, just because I'm in the presence of other people and I can like, you know, when I'm by myself in my home studio, I can kind of be like, okay, that's, that's good. But when I'm with other people, I'm like, okay, no, that's not, For that's sure. not good. But Absolutely. then also when you, when you start getting tired and you do sort of start getting that repetitive um, because you're listening to things back maybe so often, or you're doing a track over and over again, you sort of start losing your perspective a little bit and it's good to have someone there who's like, let's do that one more time Definitely. or yes. think, think of it from this perspective or, or do it a little bit in this way. Um, yeah. Just having someone who can be, who can be objective about things um, and can hear stuff that you can't. And also it means that you can, you can focus exclusively on just performing or, or just be just listening to what other people are doing rather than uh, having to like bounce back and forth and record stuff and then sing it and then edit it and listen back and all of that. So it's, it's great to have someone else to have another set of ears in the room. But also more specifically for this project, um, it got to a point, it was kind of like what I was saying before when it was maybe going to end up being more of an electronic thing. It got to a point where it was just like, this needs to have a band on it. Like we rehearsed, we rehearsed those, um, all of the songs were worked through like in a rehearsal studio with everyone playing together in a room um and then we and then we track after we'd worked out those arrangements that way then we tracked those parts like that it wouldn't none of that would have happened it was just like you know i can do i can do bass parts or guitar parts or synth parts or whatever but um it always there's no substitute for for you can tell, I think, when something is just kind of assembled, for that kind of music, it's just assembled in the box versus uh, having been worked through with players in a room interacting with one another. Thank you so much for talking with us. It, it, Thank you we're, for having me. We really are looking forward to the whole album coming out. Um, the single is definitely um, played around our office often. Oh. Thank you so much. I cool. appreciate your time very much. Likewise. Thank you. I'll talk to you another time. Okay, bye. Okay.